protects and trusts. Patient love doesn't boast and isn't proud. Love rejoices with truth. It's not self-seeking or rude. It keeps no records of wrong. It perseveres and never fails. Yes, it's time to get real. Hi, this is the of the bartender, Neil Nance. <laughs> Pastor Jay has asked me to invite you all to join us to get real here at the Ecclesia Cafe Piano Bar. And uh, here is Pastor Jay. The greatest thing you'll ever learn just to love and be loved in return. Is that what we've been talking about? At Real 2000 in the Ecclesia Cafe and Tana Bar and Bible Study. <laughs> and uh, we're going to get started now on our next teaching. And it's called Faith, Hope, and love. And this is number 59. Faith, hope, and love. And love is the best, as you know. To learn God's forgiveness is to learn unconditional love, which is the greatest of all. We have hope because of our faith. And it's through faith we have empowerment. Today's New International Version in Matthew 18, 18. It says, Truly, I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose, loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. At that time, the disciples didn't really understand this empowerment they were receiving. And they wouldn't understand it until after Jesus was crucified. John tells us in, this, in his letter that when Jesus came to them after he had risen, he appeared to them in this room, he did something very special so that they could understand. Though evidently he knew. He knew all the time that they wouldn't. But uh, let's go on. Uh, today's New International Version, John. 20, 19, and it says, On the evening of the first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish uh, leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. The doors are all locked, and Jesus all of a sudden is there, saying, Peace be with you. 20, after he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. 21. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. 22. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. A lot of people think they received the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. But here we see that it was when he visited them in the room. He said he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. Maybe it was just temporary. I don't know. 23. If you forgive the sins of anyone, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Luke wrote in Luke 24, 37, and 39 that the disciples were startled and frightened, thinking that they saw a ghost when Jesus in his new body came into their room. He said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. 
A ghost doesn't have flesh and bones, as you see I have. How would you feel? <laughs> it's Jesus standing there, and you have the doors all locked, secured, and Jesus all of a sudden is there. I appeared, but I've got flesh and bones. And the most important part is in Luke 24, 45, when Luke writes, Then he opened their minds so they could understand scriptures. We learned from John that Jesus breathed on them. So he opened their minds by breathing on them. And it was by receiving the Holy Spirit that they were finally able to realize what had happened to them. They could understand the scriptures. When my mother was concerned that maybe her relatives who had studied the scriptures all their lives but had passed on already, maybe they had not been saved or had not believed what they read. When she looked at me for answers with <laughs> that deep grief in her eyes, this scripture came to mind that Jesus opened the minds of the disciples led by the Holy Spirit. My question then, after some have faithfully studied the word all of their lives and loved God above all else in their lives and lived according to, their, to his principles, but maybe because their teachers were false teachers and caused them to be frightened and not fully understand, why couldn't God, seconds before they would go with him, still open their minds before it was too late? I, I've gone to pray with people at, at uh, the hospitals, and, uh, and I remember one fellow had been in an automobile accident that went to our church in Las Vegas basically in a coma, and he was that way for a week or two. And I thought, why be in a coma? Maybe God is talking to him, <laughs> getting his robes clean <laughs> before he goes on to spend eternity in God's kingdom. Could it happen during those periods of time? And then maybe it won't even matter to us then. Jesus goes on to explain more about their empowerment. Let's go to today's New International Version, Matthew 18, verse 19. It says, again, truly, I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything you ask for, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. 20, for where two or three come together in my name, see, a lot of us think that we have the power to do it, but it has to be in the name of Jesus. You come together in my name, there am I with them. So, if you're watching or listening to this show right now, then there are at least two of us here, right? If so, then God is with us right now. I just pray that he's here. Does this say something that will encourage you and build you up? You are the called out ones at this time. And God is, is with us, among us. And we have to pray and, and put it in his name. So in the name of Jesus Christ, I just pray that the Father would be right here with us. So his presence would be the same as it is in any other place or time. Maybe even closer now because this would be like quality time that we would be spending with him. It's quality, it's set apart, it wasn't planned, we just happened to get together. As we move on in our scriptures chronologically, we come to the part where forgiveness is such an important part of the teaching of Jesus. The last time being together, when we were together, we saw where those who are more spiritual should try to strengthen and guide those who are weaker. And it says to be gentle with them. In this next parable, we will see where this needs to be followed by godly treatment and forgiveness. First, Peter sets it up. As usual, he usually says something or does something, but Peter sets it up by asking a very important question. So in today's New International Version, I like to give scripture because then this is my confirmation. Matthew 18, 20, it says, Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, 
How many times shall I forgive someone who sins against me? Up to seven times? Then Luke includes in his writing for this particular teaching of Jesus, the uh, Today New International Version, Luke 17, 3. It says, if a brother or sister sins against you, rebuke them. And if they repent, forgive them. For even if they sin against you seven times a day, and seven times come back to you and say, I repent. You must forgive them. Now back to Matthew for an example of this. This is a little bit longer. Uh, today's New International Version, Matthew 18, 23. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. 24. As he began the, the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. 25. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. 26. The servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged. I will pay back everything. 27. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. 28. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. 29. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, Be patient with me. I'll pay you back. 30. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. 31. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed and went and told their master everything that had happened. 32. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. 33. Shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? 34. In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. 35. This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive a brother or sister from your heart. In Ephesians 4.32, Paul writes, Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. We all bear many scars of offenses done against us. Remember, the scars are only on the outside, <clears throat> not on the inside, unless we allow them to be. Now, you can allow them to be there, and you can have a pity party for the rest of your life if you want, or you can just get rid of that. I'm sure many psychologists would disagree with me very much, but my faith tells me that God is greater than any problem we could have in this life. If we just know how to approach Him and give it to Him and allow Him to take it, once we give him the problem, we don't say, oh, well, you're taking too long, I'm going to take it back, <laughs> do it myself. No, we can't take it back. We have to give it to him, and in his time, it will be taken care of. It's the same thing with forgiveness. If we find it's difficult for us to forgive someone, give it to God. Just let God do it. Say, Lord, you know my heart, you know how bitter I am inside. Lord, please. Allow me to have a peace about this and eventually get over this feeling that I have. I forgive them in your name. We can't let the outside flesh start to grow a bitter root in our soul and our spirit. It will. If it's on the outside, there's a root that will go right down on the inside into our spirit and soul and our hearts. Forgive any and all offenses. Can you imagine all that God has seen, knows, and has forgiven us for? 
maybe even things we didn't realize were offenses against God or others. He forgave us. Things we didn't even know. If we who have been forgiven so much are unwilling to forgive others, God might say, here, I'm giving back to you all the offenses you've committed to others now. Paul makes it quite clear in his letter to the church in Corinth that it's not how spiritual we appear to be. Let's go to the scripture of Paul's. Today's New International Version, 1 Corinthians 13, 1. Paul says, If I speak in human or angelic tongues, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong, 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 or a clanging cymbal, too. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I'm nothing. Three, if I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to worship, that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Four, love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy, does not boast. It is not proud. Five, it does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no records of wrongs. This is what love is, if you're wondering. Six, love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with truth. Seven, it always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Eight, love never fails. Now this is why we said faith, hope, and love, but the best is love. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. Nine, for we know in part and we prophesy in part. Ten, but when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. Eleven, when I was a child, Paul said, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. Twelve, for now we see only a reflection. Then, or the Lord, then we shall see face to face. Now, I only know part. Then, I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. 13. And now these three remain. That happens to be the title of our message. Faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Where is love in the church? It's in here, folks. If you're watching, be sure you've got it in here. Meet with other Christians. Maybe you can make a difference in those places. If what they're teaching and what they're going after does not first have love, it is nothing. Let the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, your mind. He gives faith, hope, and love to feed your soul. But of the three, love stands alone. God tells us to love Him first and above all, and then to love your neighbor as yourself. That's what this is all about. We'll see you next time. Now I live in all your
promises And nothing seems worthwhile Except to be In your kingdom of love 